Yeah. Uh, so, hello and uh, welcome to the fifth episode of the Green Bandit. Uh, I'm Deberto Sinha and I lead this climate and systems team at UD, uh, which focuses on law and policy issues related to species and ecosystem with the primary goal of making laws uh, more ecocentric and uh, responsive to the modern day environment challenges. Uh, you can also visit our website uh, and check the topic climate ecosystems through access of publications, documentaries, uh, and op-eds we, we have done. Uh, about this series, Green Mandate, so we have launched this series uh, in February 2022, uh, this year, in partnership with the Environmental Brain Matter Foundation. Uh, when we realized that although we have different organizations, experts working on some very important issues, uh, we have very limited space to you know, integrate those knowledge and expertise in the legal space. And three of our first green mandates were on the proposed amendments to the uh, different laws, like biodiversity bill, wildlife protection bill, plastic rules. And our last green mandate was on cheater introduction. So there was a deal news that uh, by 15th uh, August, there will be the first set of cheetahs introduced in the Kuno uh, Panpur. So we invited Dr. Enkin Singh. And today we are going to have this uh, discussion with uh, Dr. Abhi Vanak uh, on managing uh, feral dogs in wildlife habitats. So, and uh, I must mention that today is also International Tiger Day, and that makes our topic even more relevant for the day, because in the last Tiger Census by NPCA, National Tiger Conservation Authority, it mentioned that in almost all tiger reserves, uh, the, the camera trap, uh, but to which they get the information of tiger, the common numbers, they got photos of feral dogs. Uh, and uh, it specifically mentioned in the NPCA report that uh, they are threat to the tigers, uh, they are comp competitors to the other carnivores and they are also trans they are, uh, transmitter of uh, pathogens. So details we will be talk uh, during the session from, uh, because he is the best person to uh, tell about those, this thing. Uh, just to give a brief introduction about Dr. Abhi Vanak. So he is a professor at NACD uh, where he works on biodiversity conservation as well as uh, policy design aspect of it. Uh, he is an animal ecologist with his PhD from US and postdoc from South Africa. Uh, his interest in disease ecology uh, led him to explore uh, the dynamics of pathogen transmission between domestic animals and native wildlife uh, using the One Health framework. So, and uh, just adding to this, uh, I want to add that you know, if you Google about uh, anything about red dogs or stray dogs in India, you will definitely see his quote or interview in some article. So, and I think he is the best person to talk about uh, this issue of dog and wildlife conflict. And uh, uh, I just I also want to make it clear that this this talk we are focusing entirely on uh, the issue of dog and wildlife. There are issues about dog in the urban setup, so I think these are two different issues. And uh, here we are talking only about the dog and uh, wildlife conflict. And uh, on behalf of Vidhi and the audience present today, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Abhi Banak. Uh, so, uh, Abhi, most of your uh, uh, most of the research on feral dogs and interaction in wildlife is either authored by you or associates. And you also take, like, you know, a lot of efforts to use research findings to educate stakeholders and form policy making processes, taking part in, in various meetings. And you always heard you talking about this issue. And we all know the issue of dog is a very sensitive one. And they do have a different perspective towards you talk to many people, you will have different perspective about dogs. And uh, so I think before we start this thing, uh, this conversation about the topic, uh, why don't you just uh, uh, share a story like how you got interested in this subject? Because the subject itself is a very uh, specialized subject. And you might have faced many challenges when you thought of starting doing, doing this work on to India. So yeah, just start from there and then we can, I can ask you questions. Also, after this uh, talk, we're also taking some audience questions. Uh, so that also uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Devatyo, for inviting me to to be part of this conversation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so, I'll, you know, you you mentioned a lot of important things in your in your introduction about this topic of of free ranging domestic dogs, and um, and you know this is something I first first started noticing or first started thinking about when I was doing my PhD research. Um, way back in 2002, 2003. At that time, I wanted to study mesocarnivores in in India. Um, you know, mostly Indian foxes and um, and other mesocarnivores like golden jackals and, and jungle cats. So when I started doing my uh, preliminary, my prime preliminary field field work, the pilot work, I was doing camera trap studies in uh, uh, Rolla Padu and Rani Benur and you know those kinds of wildlife sanctuaries. 
And I noticed that in those camera traps, the most common animal that I started seeing were domestic dogs. And so this led my PhD advisor and, 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 and I uh, to, to think about what role domestic dogs could play in structuring these, car these carnivore communities. You know, because dogs are also carnivores. So what role could they play in this, in this ecosystem? And, uh, and they were clearly very numerous, uh, by far the most common. So this is how I started looking at, uh, looking at the topic of domestic dogs in wildlife spaces. My PhD topic then focused on competition between domestic dogs and Indian foxes as an example of a mesocarnivore. It was, um, it was one of the first studies to look at uh, GPS or uh, at that time it was radio telemetry, radio telemetry of domestic dogs and, and, a, and Indian foxes in India, a uh, fairly large scale study. We also then included a component on disease ecology with my colleague, uh, Dr. Anirudh Belsare, uh, who subsequently also went on to do his PhD in the US. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's how it started. And that's how I started reading more about uh, domestic dogs. We started publishing. And then as we started doing our research, other people also started noticing similar stuff happening in reserves all around the world. And that, that body of literature has been growing quite a bit um, since then. So there's lots of evidence that domestic dogs are an important uh, predator in natural ecosystems and are almost like an invasive species in most places that they occur in. Yeah, thank you uh, Abhi, for sharing uh, how it started. And actually what I understand is, is this topic is like something you came to know during your research work. And during your study about the carnivores in wildlife. So that, uh, sorry. So, uh, when we discuss about feral dogs, so when I discuss with uh, other conservationists, so different people have different opinions because this term feral dogs is used by NTC and many other uh, research papers. So I think it will be useful if you can you can just explain what is the origin of the term feral dogs, what it means, and uh, how they are different from the other uh, synonyms you use, such as the stray dog or like you know uh, street dog or domestic dog or wild dog. So, you know, how to different, how to understand that for a common man, like for him, a dog is dog. So, yeah. yeah. So, so the term, the term feral is a very specific term and it's, it's got a scientific definition to it. It, it means any domestic animal that has become wild again. Okay. So it's gone back to a wild state and is now free of human dependence. So it's no longer dependent on human beings for living their lives. So by that definition, uh, India does not have too many populations of feral dogs, true feral dogs. There are probably a few populations, a few pockets in, in places like the Trans Himalayas and in some uh, parts of the Thar Desert, which are remote. And this is so mainly because there are very few places in India without human influence. So most of the dogs that we see on the around us are uh, free ranging domestic dogs. So the term, so, you know, they are domestic dogs. They've, you know, we've, uh, they're the, one of the first species to have been domesticated from the wolf. And so the term uh, for domestic dog or free ranging dog is more accurate to use. Feral dog is, is probably not, not an accurate term to use when describing dogs that we see out here. The word stray dog is uh, is, is a value laden term that I would avoid using because then it assumes that they've, um, that they've strayed into some space and, you know, it's, I, I, I it, it doesn't seem, there's no scientific definition of it. There's also no, some, no such thing as a street dog. I mean, just because dogs live on streets doesn't make them street dogs. Uh, you can happily adopt them and they live in your home, then they become home dogs. Um, so I don't like the idea of a street dog, even though the ABC rules under, uh, that were passed by the Ministry of Culture in 2001 created a legal entity called street dogs, which does not exist anywhere else in the world and which is hugely problematic. Yeah, thank you for clarifying this thing. Uh, because we often use this term, I think primarily because the NPCA in the document, most of the uh, scientific term, like you know, people misuse like somehow with the terms. So it's a very uh, thanks for uh, telling this. Now tell me one thing, like why we uh, 
has failed on this problematic for wildlife and uh, how serious is uh, this issue in india and if you can like you know uh, elaborate this with some example like there are this kind of sorry i for the term feral dogs i will use for free ranging uh, domestic dogs or no uh, so like yeah like if you can just share like how this free ranging domestic dogs are actually uh, how they are affecting the wildlife because some cases i am reading they are also positive they may be negative you know you know better so um, you know as i mentioned domestic dogs are um, are a carnivore or a species they are um, they are a subspecies of the wolf so even now their scientific name is canis lupus familiaris so which means that they are subspecies of the wolf um, and even though they've been domesticated they still retain a lot of characteristics that that allow them to main, keep their hunting you know the hunting instinct uh, dogs are very curious by nature as well all all of us who uh, who have pet dogs know this they're very playful but when when you then have large numbers of domestic dogs out in rural areas either in around farms or in national parks and wildlife sanctuaries then they tend to of course interact with the wildlife that's there so if a if a dog or a pack of dogs then sees a deer or or any herbivore they're they're going to chase them often hunt them kill them uh, they may of, of course eat them as well uh, so we did a survey across india and we found my my former phd student chandrima home uh, led this survey and we found that dogs were seen directly seen to attack or kill more than 80 species of wildlife in india uh, many of which are endangered or even critically endangered um, so you know predation that is direct predation chasing killing attacking are obviously the biggest threat that you can have to wildlife in addition to that domestic dogs are also carnivores so amongst carnivores they can also be competitors with other carnivores with other wild carnivores whether they be foxes or jackals or wolves or hyenas um dogs have also been known to chase leopards leopards away although they can also be food for leopards uh they can be competitors in several ways they can you know be competitors for food they can also be competitors in terms of just harassment because dogs will chase any other carnivore away from and so even my my phd study and now growing body of literature shows that wildlife tends to avoid areas where dogs are present so there is both a direct effect and an indirect effect the very the mere presence of dogs can prevent wild animals from using those landscapes um in addition dogs can have a very wide fairly widespread impact um because they because of their sheer numbers they can uh, be a reservoir for lots of diseases that can impact wild carnivores the most uh, the most obvious one or the most common one that we hear about is a uh, canine distemper virus and we hear of this a lot because a lot of species are known to die from it uh we also have species uh, very deadly diseases like rabies and india is the world capital of rabies unfortunately we have more than 20000 human fatalities uh due to rabies every year uh, which are primarily spread by dogs lots of wildlife also succumb to rabies from from domestic dogs um you know dog feces can also help transmit uh helminth parasites or internal parasites um, Uh, and you know you can see mange occurring once in a while in in wild carnivores foxes are, there was some there was an outbreak of mange in red foxes in or the desert fox in rajasthan recently potentially coming from domestic dogs there's um there's been reports of lions getting cdv uh, and tigers getting cdv so um, so all of these factors once you put them together um then tells us that domestic dogs can have a fairly large impact on wildlife and this is especially problematic because of the numbers of domestic dogs that we have in our rural areas so even if dogs you know might not be very effective at killing animals the fact that they are chasing them constantly doesn't give any relief to herbivores or um, or any of these wild animals that are out there uh, and if they do manage to catch an animal then the death is very slow and very painful because dogs their jaws their their you know the evolutionary the the domestication process has made their jaws and bo- and body weaker than they would normally then be then then be for a wolf so um so the uh 
So the, it's a, the, the animal that it catches will often die a slow, painful death. It's not like a wild dog or something killing it. So, um, you know, that's, the, you know, that's so it's from an animal welfare perspective also, it can be quite a bit, bit, bit of a problem. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, so uh, now you mentioned that you know, uh, like they evolved from wolves, uh, these domestic dogs, especially. And we know we have some near, uh, like, you know, like members for this, like having some common ancestors, like we have old wild dogs, we have wolves uh, everywhere in the country, though their numbers are diminishing. Then we have other carnivores, like which we can trace their ancestry common. So. Uh, did we research like you came across an instance where this uh, free ranging dogs are crossbreeding with any other wild, wild animals like wolves or wolves? And uh, if yes, then do you see it as a normal like evolution process or it's a threat to the native fauna? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. Question, please. I, I couldn't quite hear it. Okay. So I'm saying that uh, because this uh, domestic dogs and uh, wolves, they are they have a common ancestor. Yeah. And they have, like, you know, I was reading through some literature that like, uh, there have been many uh, occasions where dogs bred with other animals. And, you know, there is not a common, like, you know, ancestor, to, it's, uh, like, you can trace any common ancestry to the dogs. But uh, I also came across incidences where uh, we have seen that, you know, I've read that, you know, dom domestic dogs can breed with wolves yes. and other carnivores. Yes. Yes, yes. So, like, you know, you are a subject expert. So, can you tell us, like, if this is true and in your, in your personal experience, whether you have, uh, you have seen such things happening in India and whether this is a normal, natural, like, evolutionary process or uh, is actually a threat to the native fauna? Yeah. So, um, you know, thanks. That's a, that's a really important question. And this is one way that, that we're actually currently grappling with. So, uh, like I mentioned previously, domestic dogs are sort of uh, are directly related to wolves. They, they, they were domesticated from wolves. And uh, uh, there's lots of genetic evidence to show that domestic dogs now are genetic, you know, they are a sub lineage of the overall wolf genome that they separate out because of the domestic creation process. But there's also evidence that, you know, in the historical past, uh, dogs and wolves did interbreed with each other. So there were what's called introgressions of wolf genome back into dogs. Um, but when you have interbreeding happening and hybridization or back cross happening between domestic dogs and wolves, this can cause a problem for wild wolf populations. Um, and we are seeing evidence of this now in India. It's, it's been recorded other places. It's been recorded in India as well. Certainly we've seen um, lots of photographs of uh, wolf packs that have dog-like animals in them. And uh, there's also, you know, mating has been observed between domestic dogs and wolves in the wild. <clears throat> and now in a study that, that we are doing uh, with Professor Umar Ramakrishnan at NCBS, we're looking at the genomic evidence for hybridization and, and we're finding out that actually there is a signature of uh, hybridization between wolves and domestic dogs. And so that, you know, this is really problematic because uh, if, you, if you think about what this means is it is is that wolf genome or wolf genes are getting diluted because of the incursion of dog genes into wolf genes and um, why is this problematic because we've domesticated dogs the domestication procedure process has resulted in several changes in the dog's morphology its body shape it's made like i said it's made it's the bodies are smaller the jaws are weaker the skulls are smaller and you don't want those genes passing on to wolves because then that will affect their ability to survive in the wild. Okay. So that's why I think it's very important for us to try and prevent this, this happening. How we do it is very challenging because wolves uh, and dogs share a lot of space in our countryside. And uh, it's, there, is a, there is a hypothesis that when wolf populations decline, that's when hybridization is more likely to happen. So, uh, you know, it's like a double whammy. Wolf populations already declining, and then the few remaining ones that are there then tend to hybridize, uh, and so then you know it's it's a it's a slippery slope. It's all downhill from there. So, uh, like you already mentioned, that you know there have been uh, historically wolves and dogs have interbred, like you know, in the past, and dogs are like the earliest, like you know, animal domesticated by human civilization. 
initially by hunters then by farming communities for uh, production and then now we have many other use of dogs so this interaction of this free ranging domestic dogs with wildlife is not new this has been must be happening for thousands of years so to say i don't know to say that you know there's a pure population of wolf or pure population of domestic dogs i don't think it is uh, personally i don't think you might, you might know it better so what then what is it is what is creating a problem now because you know if you see the time frame of just last 20 30 years it is nothing compared to the history of the earth or history of the human civilization so did this problem surface very recently or it is long standing problem which was never addressed because i am a little confused here like you know this was there since beginning then why this problem is so so yeah look when you when you say when you say that you know dogs and wolves have interbred in the past what we find evidence of is that the wolves have bred with dogs so the dog genome then carries the signature of its wolf ancestor so it shows integration that means the dog uh, dogs the, that means wolves uh, you know there's the, the directionality matters uh, wolves are mating with dogs and then those are continuing to be dogs but when dogs breed with wolves and then those are raised as wolves um, so it adds to the wolf population rather than the dog side do you do you understand the difference Uh, because basically what you're saying is that uh, you're 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 essen- in in some sense you're essentially um, diluting the wolf gene pool by by reintroducing by or by introducing dog genes into it uh, now did this happen historically we don't know there was there's not much genetic uh, there's not much evidence in in you know in the genetic signature that dogs bred with wolves very often but there is evidence the other way around um and now we are finding out that that you know there is there is ev- evidence of hybridization in wild wolves okay so that's that's the history that i want to or that's the part that i want to make sure that we we are clear about why is this a problem now and what potentially it wasn't a problem before is because wolves are pretty endangered in india india currently they are you know they don't uh they don't even though they're probably as endangered as the tiger nobody talks about wolves most people don't even know there are wolves in india they occur in the grasslands of india in the savannas of india in the drier habitats and they occur in the himalayas in the trans himalayas uh the genetic evidence also shows that wolves indian wolves both the the one that's found in the plains and the one that's found in the himalayas are the oldest lineages of wolf, wolves in the world so they might actually be uh the precursors of all other wolves that we see elsewhere in the world okay so that's why it's really important for us to protect these genetic lineages of animals uh, we are our wolves are unique and we should do more to conserve them so that's why it's important for us to ensure that um, uh, you know dog wolf hybridization does not happen thank you i think uh, although like i was not very convinced of this because uh, this research is like scientific research has advanced in the last several years but i think you elaborated the point very well that wolf population is declining and that's and it's endangered and in this situation like you know uh, if the dog population interbreeding with the wolves when we may lose the pure uh, line of the wolf i think that is what so we have to save the wolf from the dogs that's i think yeah. what is the yeah so now uh, the other question i have is uh, like about the integral competition now you are the expert on that uh, so recently i saw a video where tiger was eating a dog so dog was there tiger just jumped over it and ate it yeah. and it is a known thing that you know leopards especially in the outskirts urban areas they thrive on dogs i think their only food is dog in some areas dog or domestic animals and in wildlife areas they are like you know they compete with uh, other carnivores so they drive away the Uh, the vultures are also like all those things. I, mean, I have also personally observed that you know vultures standing here and they cannot come because dogs are already there. So, but now uh, this kind of observation, in my opinion personally, I think uh, is more in the disturbed habitats. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know, or like you know where there are more presence of human or you know the the change in ecosystem has drive away the top carnivores like tigers or like you know lions or whatever. so in those cases it, it is easy for dogs to compete with the small and medium carnivores so is it right to say that you know if you change the perspective like not focusing on dog but let's focus on like why these fringe dogs are in their wild habitats in the protected areas are we failing to protect our wildlife that you know the tigers and all the uh, big carnivores are not uh, are just you know driven away because of lack of herbivores lack of protection 
okay, and they're replaced by small and medium carnivores, including the free-ranging dogs. So can you just uh, share your opinion on that as an uh, ecologist, what is your observation? Okay, so you, you raise um, several important points here. Uh, and some of these are philosophical, some of them are scientific, and some of them are a mix of both. So, you know, if you want, I, I, I think for us, we have to be in a country like India, we have to be careful not to, um, not to say that there is, there is a there out where animals should be or why wild animals should be. And there's a here where only humans should be, okay? Because we have a shared history. There's no place in India that does not have human influence in it. Okay? Because we're, you know, we are, our country, even though it is very large, also has a very large human footprint, you know, 1.3, almost 1.4 billion people. Uh, it's a miracle we've managed to conserve all the species that we have been able to conserve. And we are a great success story in that regard. You know, I mean, Europe, Europe and North America uh, exterminated most of their large wildlife uh, long, long ago. Uh, but we still have them. We still learn, learn to live with them. So for us to then say that there are some places that animals should be is a little problematic because animals are also between the spaces where humans can be. Okay. Um, in fact, just in um, today's Hindu, Uma Ramakrishnan has written a really nice uh, editorial about uh, landscape connectivity for tigers, the importance of landscape connectivity for tigers. Now, today is World International Tiger Day. So, you know, if tigers are supposed to move between protected areas, they'll have to pass through human landscapes or human occupied landscapes. And that is true for all other wild animals as well. There's no place where there are no humans. So, the idea that domestic dogs are going into wildlife areas or wild animals are coming into human areas is, is um, you know, is a problematic space to define because they're all, they're all contiguous. For us, then we have to then take a stand. What is it that we value more? Okay, do we value our wildlife or would we rather have all our spaces be overrun with millions of domestic dogs? And there are millions, you know, there's uh, between 60 to 80 million domestic dogs in India. That's a very large population of dogs. Uh, many of them do not have, in, you know, they're, they're not owned, they're surviving on garbage or they're surviving on, on offal from, you know, when people are throwing, you mentioned, you mentioned carcasses and vultures. So, uh, we, had, we had, you know, one of my PhD students, Chetan Mishar is doing, uh, has finished a, st a study in Rajasthan where he's looking at the competition between vultures and dogs. It was hypothesized that the, the decline in the vulture population may have led to the increase in dog populations in, in rural areas. Um, and this is something we're trying to test post hoc. So, but we certainly can see that the, now that the dog population has increased, they are certainly impeding vulture recovery in certain areas because they're preventing access to those carcasses. Okay. So where dogs are now, they're preventing wildlife to also be in those spaces. And is that something that we want to see? Do we want to see our natural landscape. So I, I do a study in Baramati where there's lots of wildlife in rural areas. Okay, there's, dog, there's jackals, there's foxes, jungle cats, uh, chinkara, there's striped hyenas, um, and there's lots and lots of dogs. So the, the wildlife is always having to, um, you know, find their way around where the dogs are. They're not able to, you know, they're always sort of trying to avoid competition with domestic dogs. And then that makes me wonder why do we have so many dogs and what purpose does it serve? Um, you know, can't we do a better job at reducing our domestic dog population so that uh, other species also, because they are, they are basically an extension of us. They are like a, they, you know, they are a human induced edge effect. They are just extending far into any natural area. So now I have some, uh vegan positive question, but before that, I want to just uh, know from you, uh, because there are many examples of how dogs affect the recovery of, because you mentioned about recovery of, affect recovery of particularly Indian species like vulture, which are 97% were wiped from India because of the of neck. And dogs are getting nuisance for vulture recovery. Now, uh, you talk about uh, this great Indian bustard. I think less than 100 are left in India. It was once supposed to be the national, national bird of India, but uh, Indian bustard is a very has a very uh, deep cultural significance as well as it's a, it's a uh, many uh, biological history to it. So, how does this uh, free-ranging dogs 
uh, like affecting the recovery of getting the bustard. Because uh, there are some examples that I will come to later on. But first, like if the dogs have any role, any role to uh, like you know uh, the recent dwindling of population of mammal bustards, the ground birds. Yeah. Um, so look, we've um, you know I I've been observing since 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 I started my PhD work in two thousand and two. Uh, when I was doing my first surveys in areas that used to have mustards in Rolapadu, uh, in Nanaj, in Rani Benur, uh, you know, these are all grassland areas. So this is where also my interest in grassland savanna conservation comes from. Uh, we've seen that domestic dogs are everywhere. And if, if, you have a, if you have a bird that's ground nesting, that raises one, that lays one egg and raises one chick a year, then clearly any predation by any species on this bird is going to, is going to be problematic. Uh, if you look at natural predators in this landscape, they'll probably be Indian foxes and jungle cats. Um, and Indian foxes, you know, a bustard can chase, chase away an Indian fox. It's a big bird. We've seen that happening personally. We've seen how bustards can defend their eggs and their chicks from Indian foxes, but it can't do that against a domestic dog. And we know so many reports of dogs uh, eating eating eggs or killing chicks. Uh, even in the places where their last stronghold is in, in Rajasthan, in the Desert National Park, there were, there were reports of this happening. And this is why uh, the authorities now are taking active steps to uh, you know, try and reduce the dog population in that landscape. And this is imperative because look, even if one chick goes from a population, from a breeding population that has maybe about 10 or 12% uh, chicks hatching annually, that's about you know, that's 10% mortality. I mean, that's 10% loss in that year's breed. And we cannot, like every, we are down to the last 100 or so birds. We, you know, every single chick, is, every single animal is important. We've already lost them from, from Maharashtra. We have lost them from, uh, from Andhra. Gujarat government has said, we, we can't conserve the last of three or four busters that we have here now. It went off from, you know, from Madhya Pradesh long time ago, Karnataka lost them long time ago. So, so, you know, people say, oh, we see one here, we see two or three here. Those are all functionally extinct populations. They're all, it's gone. So Rajasthan is our last hope and there's absolutely no way we should allow something like domestic dogs to, to prevent recovery of the species. So, yeah, you mentioned the example of uh, Rajasthan, I think Desert National Park. So Rajasthan's last hope. And I think it's the only state uh, where we are from, like, which is uh, this uh, GIBs are found now. So I was reading that WII, Wildlife Institute of India, and uh, that's the first department. They are doing something for uh, control of population of dogs. But what they're doing is, uh, what they can do, uh, like, you know, is what the law will allow them. Uh, so, so one thing is that the law we have for, uh, that I will come to later on. So, uh, so uh, what they're doing is they are like uh, doing this next relation campaign of the dogs. That this ABC rule, this uh, animal birth control rule suggests. But uh, sterilization alone, uh, I don't know if it can, uh, sterilize dog can actually, like, you know, this is what, even I have a dog, so people say that if you sterilize a dog, it will, you know, the question will be subsided, and, you know, it will take less. So, uh, in GIB, in context of GIB, the National Park, whether sterilization alone can, uh, like, you know, resolve this issue, like chasing or, you know, eating their eggs or, you know, whatever you said. So do you think uh, that this is enough? Because I'm telling you because uh, US has a separate law, which is for deals with wildlife dog interaction. And India, our law we have is on the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act, 1960, under which there are animal birth control rule, which says that you can only vaccinate a sterilized dog and you have to release them back to the same area. And local bodies are responsible for sterilization vaccination. So the focus is on the sterilization vaccination. Okay, and we have Wild Protection Act, so that we will discuss later on. So. So, uh, do you think this, uh, what is legally allowed, sterilization, vaccination of the dogs will help the wildlife cause? Because this is what the that's the first department in WI are doing. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is lazy thinking, and this is sort of a cop out because the animal welfare lobby in India is very powerful, and it's got some powerful politicians backing it, and you know they've been known to call in and threaten anybody who takes any action against against dogs. So, I think this is. Uh, you know, there's no science behind the ABC program. We've done several modeling exercises to show that uh, this just doesn't work. Not the way it is being done and the kind of effort required to actually control dog population using ABC 
we don't have the money and time and effort to do that. Okay, it's, it's a gargantuan task. Like I said, it's probably about 80 million dogs. The question comes, you know, what is your objective? Um, is your objective to maintain dogs on the streets in perpetuity? Or is your objective to treat dogs as valuable companion animals that should be at, at home with good, um, you know, with, with good care given to them? If, if that is the objective, then the ABC rules are not going to work. They are designed to keep dogs on the streets forever. The ABC rules are also highly problematic because, and this is a, this is a matter which is currently um, being heard by the Supreme Court, whether the ABC rules are actually in violation of the Parent Act, because the Parent Act, the PCA Act allows for euthanasia of domestic, in fact, allow, calls for the removal of stray dogs. Um, the Wildlife Protection Act should actually overrule the ABC rules because that's an act and these are rules. Um, so the Wildlife Protection Act mandates that, you know, if you can remove, if under the act, you can remove people from national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, then why should dogs be allowed there? You know, and sterilization doesn't make them roam any less. It doesn't make them, it doesn't mean that they're no longer hungry or not going to chase. I mean, I have two dogs at home that were sterilized. They are, they were adopted from the street, um, but they still, you know, at, in, uh, they still kill, they'll still kill their, they've killed some of my chickens and rabbits. So that doesn't stop them from doing any of those things. Uh, dogs will still attack. They will still kill, even whether they're sterilized or not. It doesn't do anything to reduce their aggression. All, all it does is it reduces aggression during breeding time because the females are you know, not coming into heat and therefore some of that mating aggression reduces. But it has nothing to do with their hunting instincts or it reduces their roaming patterns. So the idea that ABC will reduce this threat to uh, Bustard is laughable. And I, um, you know, I, again, I don't know why wildlife conservationists don't seem to speak up more about this problem. They seem to somehow be really scared of, of the animal rights lobby in India. And I've known forest department, senior forest department, the topmost officials saying, we can't do anything about this because, you know, we'll get, we'll get yelled at by, by certain politicians. So I just think this is shameful. So actually, Abhi, you mentioned about street dogs as well. So even I also think that you know the issue of uh, street dogs and the free ranging uh, domestic dogs in wildlife areas, uh, these are slightly different. I don't know like they agree or not. So uh, do you think that these two issues are very different? Because you, if you see in Delhi or Bangalore or whatever, like the cities, the behavior pattern of like you know scientifically established also the behavior pattern of the street dogs and the feral dogs. Uh, in India, we can make the free range domestic dogs. They're very different because street dogs are less aggressive. They are fearless, like they're not, they're less fearless than domestic dogs. And they have given like studies over there. So do you think that uh, we, have, we are somehow, because this PCA was, uh, PCA and ABC rules were made for urban centric, like, you know, uh, setup, like, you know, people that they live, they have posters with people and all. And then you bring this wildlife angle to it. So do you think that some, somewhere we need to have this distinction that, you know, free range domestic dogs in the wildlife areas and uh, street dogs in the urban setup? Because I think the way they behave and then they act is very different. This is my, like, I, you may share what you No, I, I, dis I disagree with you on that. I don't know what you mean by when you say they're very different. They're actually not. Uh, there's very, there's huge similarities between street dogs or dogs on streets in, in urban areas and dogs on streets in villages and in, and in farm areas and so on. If you, uh, we've, you know, our, our studies, and we've been doing this now for several years, we've been observing dogs in cities like Bangalore. And we've seen that at night, their behavior changes completely. You might, you, might, you know, you might see dogs sleeping and being lazy all day long, but at night, their behavior changes completely. We, of course, know this because anybody who's tried to walk at night or run or uh, ride a cycle or a motorcycle has been chased by dogs. Okay. Um, so here's the other question also. Even in urban areas, do we not want wildlife in our urban areas, you know, the world over cities are being ch are changing in such a way so that we can have more urban wildlife. Uh, my neighborhood in, 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 in North Bangalore, uh, about 10, 12 years ago, used to have Indian foxes when it was less developed uh, and, and jackals and jungle cats. Uh, there are cities in the US and in, uh, and in the UK that have foxes on the streets. There's, uh, there's a city in, in California uh, called Bakersfield, which has an endangered fox, the San Joaquin kit fox. You know, it's thriving in the middle of the city as one of the key places for the conservation 
of the species. You cannot imagine that happening anywhere in India. In fact, in, in India, every city that has a large urban space, urban green space, which has wildlife, also has a huge dog problem. For example, uh, in IIT Madras campus, dogs are killing deer and black buck. In the University of Hyderabad, deer are killing uh, wildlife on campus. And, and virtually every large institution which has a big campus has a problem of dogs killing wildlife. So it's not just a rural problem. Wherever you have large packs of free ranging dogs on the streets, they will attack uh, wildlife, they will kill wildlife. And so therefore I don't see this distinction as much. Yes, the problem of dogs in urban areas is different and it's different because uh, in rural areas, most of the dogs that, are, that you see out there are actually owned. So about 70 to 70%, 70 60 to 70% of dogs are owned. Farmers, villagers actually associate themselves with those dogs and they keep them on their farms to protect them, to protect their farms. The dogs you see on village streets are usually unknown. And they have very, we've, you know, we are doing some studies in, in Maharashtra on this, and they have very different behaviors as well. It's dogs that are on farms also that are more problematic for wildlife because those are the ones going out into the grasslands and into the forests and attacking animals, whereas the ones that are in the village don't move too much. Um, and this is similar also for dogs in Indian cities. You know, they, they stay confined to their neighborhoods. Thank you, Abhi, for the sharing this information about dog behavior, because uh, I personally like believe that, you know, this issue has to get into separately. Primarily because the laws see, see things differently. Because, you know, in India, unfortunately, we have wildlife protection act, which is only focused on the PA-centric model. But we know wildlife exists outside PAs as well. Only 5% is PAs, but actually, even NTCA says that one third of tigers are sending outside the PAs. Uh, so this brings me to the question, like, you know, uh, you said that uh, wildlife protection act should override other uh, rules like ABC. So NTCA has done something. In December 2020, they have published one uh, uh, SOP on managing feral dogs. This is how they uh, term, uh, document, name the document. They say managing feral dogs in tiger reserves. And uh, it says that, you know, you have to pick the dogs from, conflict dogs from the area. You have to stabilize them. You, you cannot reduce them back to the same area. But then there are also criticism to that plan because the implementation issues and all these things. So do you have any idea of how uh, good are these SOPs of the MTCA? And this is focused only for tiger reserves. That also we have to keep in mind. And is it enough? Is it, does it have enough teeth to control dog population in the tiger area? Um, you know, when, when NTCA was coming up with, with this SOP, um, somebody actually contacted me and we had given them a list of prescriptive measures and unfortunately, uh, NTCA did not pay heed to those, which is unfortunate because what they have come up with is basically a little bit of tinkering with the ABC rules. That's all they have done. What they've said is that if there are any dogs that are found within tiger reserves, they should be removed and removed to where, who's going to do it? None of, they're completely silent on that. Is the forest department going to do it? Are they going to call village panchayas? Are they going to call municipal bodies? I mean, how many tiger reserves have municipal bodies near them that will come and catch the dogs? Um, and then it says in the buffer zones, dogs should be sterilized and vaccinated and kept back there. So again, it's the ABC rules. Okay, uh, none of this is going to solve the actual problem of competition and predation, or, uh, and the you know the conflict between dogs, dogs and wildlife. So the uh, the SOPs, I, I unfortunately poorly thought through. It didn't, you know, it's again one of these. It's it's basically it's it's basically an unpracticable. Uh, uh, SOP. It's like there's nothing anybody will actually do about it. Please show me any place that has even started this, this work because who has the capacity to do it? Uh, you know, the, no tiger reserve has the capacity to go and how will they go and catch a dog? People find it difficult catching dogs in streets uh, in cities. You think somebody's going to go and catch a dog in a tiger reserve? It's not possible. Uh, so this is to, to say that, you know, you can go and catch, a, go and catch dogs, uh, uh, inside tiger reserves is, is somebody who's probably never, you know, done, tried to do that himself. So um, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm surprised that a top body like the NTCA can come up with, with, uh, with this kind of an SOP. It's, uh, I, I do wish they had consulted more. So, uh, so we have discussed about the issue and we have discussed about the, the outlining the problems on the law as well. And how like you know, so now now in your opinion like uh, 
what should the ideal solution? Because in conservation, we always say that you have to involve communities. We should have a bottom-up approach. We should also should complement with the law supporting you. So, in your opinion, like in your experience, uh, what should be the ideal legal framework or policy framework should look like? Like you know, managing uh, free ranging the dogs. And I will like if you can specify like if it is same for wildlife and non like urban areas or it should be separate whatever like. Uh, what a session you have for that, you know, what the ideal policy framework should look like for managing the free ranging domestic dogs? For me, it's uh, it's very simple. To me, I think it, it requires us to reimagine our relationship with domestic dogs. Um, the problem of dogs in wildlife areas is not, is not unique to India. Uh, it's there everywhere. But the scale of the problem that we see in India is certainly unique to India. Um, in Western countries, you have people walking there, pet dogs, uh, and there's, you know, you'll see signs of, uh, everywhere that says no dogs off leash, you know, keep your dog close to you, don't let it wander off into the, because they know that those dogs can go and disturb breeding birds or disturb show birds or have negative impacts on wildlife in those areas. What do we do in India? Uh, you know, it's, we seem to have no control of our dog population. But that stems primarily from us um, not being able to fix our own, re own relationship with dogs. So if, for me, that, that needs to be sorted. And that's a big problem. That needs to, that'll take time. There's no silver bullet to any of these issues. Uh, basically, if you, if you think the problem starts in rural areas, where, you know, these own dogs are going out and, and, and harassing wildlife, then you have to work with the villagers, you have to work with farmers, um, you know, create, increase awareness. Let's start first by asking farmers to identify the dogs that are, that, that are there. And let's start by taking better health care, giving better health care for those animals. Let, let's get them vaccinated for rabies and for other diseases so that they live long, healthy lives. Let's concentrate on sterilization of those dogs so they're not reproducing so much. And then, uh, especially in areas which are of conservation concern, we should then come up with a program to prevent those dogs from moving into wildlife areas. So incentives, well, I mean, maybe a carrot and stick approach needs to be used for, uh, for encouraging people to restrict the free, roam, free ranging behavior of their own dogs, just as we have, uh, we have in other countries. So then if, if, uh, if an own dog, you know, one which is identifiable to an owner, either through a microchip or through some other tag or something is seen in a wildlife area, then that person can potentially be fined for that. And that dog be removed and, and you know, uh, sometimes it has to be removed. So, sometimes it might even have to be euthanized. There's, uh, there's no, there's, look, we shouldn't shy away from this, from the idea of euthanasia as well, humane euthanasia. Let's be clear, the PCA Act allows it, Okay, there's nothing in India that prevents. Lots of people do humane euthanasia for animals, their own pets when necessary. So, uh, you know, the moment you start saying this, oh, you want to cull all dogs, you want to kill them all indiscriminately, dogs also have a right to life. You know, all of these things are, are out there, they're on paper, they're, they're nice, but let's, let's consider that even the dogs in India currently enjoy more protection on the law than even tigers do. Because in India, um, you know, the ABC rules are, are, are like some gospel truth that you can't do anything. If uh, recently a dog, um, uh, a child was killed, just yesterday, a child was killed by dogs. Okay. Nothing is going to happen to those dogs. They are going to be, you know, maybe sterilized and released back there. But if a tiger goes and kills people, the chief, chief wildlife warden has the authority to uh, have that tiger be shot. Yeah. You can't do that to dogs in this country. I mean, that this needs to change. We have to be able to fix responsibility where it needs to be fixed. We need to take the hard decisions where they need to be taken. And then we need to have better stewardship of the animals that we claim to love so much. You know, dogs on streets don't have a good life. There's very high mortality rates. Most of them don't live beyond three to four years. Pup, pup mortality is at about 80%. Uh, you know, you'll see lots of diseased dogs out there. Uh, you'll see lots of injured dogs. If you go on any street in India, you'll see dogs with broken, broken legs, you know, or really bad skin conditions. So what, there's no, there's really no benefit to keeping dogs uh, on the streets where they, they have pretty miserable lives. And I think it's only a very small fraction of people who are in favor of continuing this practice. And it's time to call them out. 
Um, and it's time for people who really love dogs to say, hey, you know what, this needs to change. And for the sake of dogs, for the sake of people, and for the sake of wildlife. Thank you, Avi, for sharing your uh, point of view in a very clear and uh, like you know strong way. I really appreciate this. And now I think we should take some questions. We have 10 to 15 minutes uh, left. So I think we have some questions, we have some comments. So I will just uh, take some relevant ones. So one is from Mariam. So I think it's a mix of comments and, and, and the question. She says that many Nagan Nigams relocate domestic and community free ranging dogs in forest areas after they pick them up. Though this is illegal, how could this dog survive in the wild? Um, yeah, so this is a huge problem. And as you mentioned, this is illegal. Uh, the municipal corporations are not allowed to do that. Forests are not some dump house for, and not just with, with dogs, but with monkeys as well. They do this regularly. So it's like we are taking our urban problems and going and putting it out there in the forest. And this is just ridiculous. This again shows that we really don't know much about how to deal with animals. Um, most of the time, these dogs will not survive in the wild by themselves. They will try and either come to the nearest human habitation. Most of them are going to die. There, there's no, so basically you're, what you're doing is you're killing those dogs, but just, you're not doing it yourself. You're, you're throwing them out there in, in some forest area. And, you know, in a very short period of time, they're either going to try and find some human settlement or they're going to die out there. They're going to be killed by a leopard or they're going to, something else is going to happen. So they're not very good at surviving, especially dogs from villages and, uh, uh, and from cities are not good at surviving only in the wild. That's why I said there's no feral, very few populations of true feral dogs. Most of the dogs that are harming wildlife originate from villages and they go out there and they come back because they're not dependent on wild foods for their, for their hundred percent for their survival. They're mostly dependent on human derived foods. Yeah. So uh, there's one more question. Uh, so it is that uh, how is the problem of stray dogs different from other stray animals? like stray cattle, which often injure people, or even stray cats, which can also carry pathogens. Yeah. Um, in, in many ways, it's not very different. Um, stray, you know, stray livestock in India uh, is also a huge problem. And there are lots of rules against it. There's lots of laws against it. You know, if, if municipal, again, municipal authorities are allowed to act to remove stray cattle from from the streets and keep them in Pandra poles or keep them in cattle shelters. Again, I don't know why dogs are only this sort of, uh, you know, given the special treatment on, under the law, all other animals are required to be removed from the streets. Uh, domestic cats or, or cats again on the street will have a similar problem. There, you know, uh, many cities that don't have dogs have huge populations of, of domestic cats. Cats also can be pretty problematic for wildlife especially for birds and other small mammals. Um, so ideally you should not have uh, large populations. So th the heart of this is subsidies or provisioning. Okay, The reason you have large populations of all of these animals is they get lots of food. They get abundant resources. Now, wherever you have lots of resources, there will be lots of animals, whether it be wild animals or domestic animals. So for us, the thing to do is to control the food source. If our cities are kept clean, there won't be that much garbage. And we have to absolutely not feed animals. We should never be feeding wildlife, it's against the law, but we should not be feeding uh, domestic dogs and cats on the streets either. I know people keep talking about how compassionate this is and we are you know, taking care of these animals, but we are not, we're actually creating a problem. People um, are spending crores of rupees on food uh, food that was grown for human consumption to feed these animals. And think about the biodiversity costs of that food, you know, of, the, of that agriculture. Remember, agriculture is one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss in the world. So uh, we are growing food for ourselves, but then we are taking, you know, tons of grains are thrown out there for, to feed pigeons. People are feeding eggs and chickens to, uh, to keep hundreds or thousands of dogs alive on the streets. I, I, I see no reason for any of this. So that's that's really one thing that has to stop. So Abhi, uh, I have one question from uh, Megha Kateria. So she asking that uh, you are constantly referring to ABC rules are the problem creator. When the protection of street dogs comes from PCA. Moreover, euthanasia under PCA is only for rabid dogs or when the dog is suffering. In your own solution, if the dog is microchipped and located, why should it be killed? Who's going to bear the cost of microchipping and infrastructure? 
Um, no, I'm afraid this is an this is an incorrect reading of the of the PC Act. The PC Act very clearly uh, allows um, allows for the removal of stray dogs. In fact, says that municipal authorities uh, have responsibility to remove stray dogs. So it's it's there along with other stray animals. And in fact, the ABC rules don't even allow the euthanasia of rabid animals. We are the only country in the world that, and because of the ABC rules. Uh, doesn't allow the humane euthanasia of rabid animals. No other country does that. And if you speak to any veterinarian, if you've ever seen a, a, a dog that's rabid, you will know that it's suffering terribly. But the ABC rules state that, oh, it has to die a natural death. There's nothing natural uh, about dying from rabies. I mean, it's a very slow, painful death. Anybody with a, an iota of compassion in their hearts will want to uh, you know, euthanize that animal very quickly so it doesn't suffer unnecessarily. So uh, this is again this you know this mindless uh, um, science-free uh, logic-free ABC rules really need to go in this country. Abhi, I have a couple of other uh, questions which are because you have mentioned certain things, so we expect this kind of question. So uh, one more question I want to ask you, and actually there are three, four more questions. Uh, so if time permits, I will take them. So the uh, question is: uh, Isn't it our responsibility as humans to understand dog ethology and behavior and act, act accordingly? Most of the times, dogs only chase or attack if provoked. What about responsible human behavior? And the last question we see in the screen also. Yeah. And uh, there are also more questions. You want to answer them? There are three or more questions. Yeah, so, we can answer them as long as we have time. And then uh, yeah. when we're out so, of time, people are most uh, welcome to contact me offline. My email address is avanak at at.org. You can contact me here or on Twitter. Um, no, I mean, for, so, so if you have time, we can extend this by 10 minutes, maybe? Yeah, yeah. so uh, can you just, uh, so you, you talk about changing human behavior. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, it's, it, to me, it, it seems that, you know, why is it that people, well, when they talk about being animal lovers, they're actually only specifically referring to dogs. They don't share this love for animals for all other animals. Uh, we don't talk about changing human behavior when it comes to living with rodents or you know what we call pests in our houses. Uh, we don't have a live and let live policy for cockroaches and mosquitoes. We actively try and eradicate them. Uh, you, you know, uh, so therefore this, and this is a great fondness for dogs. I love dogs myself. I have adopted two dogs um, and you know, they, they're like family. So, I don't think of me for a minute as somebody who hates dogs. I don't. In fact, I think of the welfare of dogs. I think that they should not be on the streets because that creates this unnecessary conflict between people and dogs. So what we want to do is we want to reduce the conflict. And one of the best ways of reducing this conflict is to try and change our policies so that we don't have dogs on the streets. Okay. Um, we, we encourage adoption of dogs. The government, again, this is where the government needs to step in. The government should step in and say mandatory license, licensing of all pet animals. Try and stop this uh, sort of, you know, this um, these puppy mills and these dog dog breeding. I mean, this is uh, we we don't we don't seem to get any of our animal welfare stuff right. But we focus only on 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 you know domestic dogs and keeping dogs in the streets. If you start fixing all of these issues, these are all systemic issues. They all need to be fixed. There is, like I said, there is no silver bullet. This will take time. But the ABC rules, you know, this whole idea that you can reduce a dog population by sterilizing them and keeping them on the streets is flawed. It doesn't work. We've shown this through, through uh, population models. Even the places, you know, places like Jaipur and Jodhpur, where they claim to have reduced the population, they, their models show that it will take uh, between 13 to 15 years for the dog population to come down by 70%. If you vaccine, if you sterilize 90% of the dog population. And we've also shown that the ABC program actually impedes the vaccination program because there's not enough capacity. So we should really think about also having animal shelters, adequate animal shelters, where we can keep dogs um, and, and encourage adoption. I mean, really have to encourage adoption of dogs. Let's think, look, Bangalore has a population of about, um, about eight lakh dogs, okay, six to eight lakh dogs. It has a population of about, um, I think, what, what is it? More than a crore humans. A very small proportion of them need to 
need to adopt dogs, these dogs for that for that population for that problem to more of more or less go away. So yes, human behavior does need to change. We need to value the dogs that we see around us. We need to stop going after all these fancy breeds that can't survive in human uh, in in Indian conditions anywhere. I mean, you know. Uh, I, I can go on about this, but I, I'll stop here. No, no, because there are so many questions. I think you're pointedly covered because I, I want to take those questions and I think it will also clarify, uh, like, you know, uh, in the rounds. So now, like, uh, you have mentioned about you have to uh, value your dogs around us, you have to take ownership, all this thing. But then also, you have to understand that, uh, you know, law or uh, anything alone cannot do, make the change, bring the changes because many things are derived from our culture. Like, you know, and there we are, like, you know, and uh, many matter of, like, you know, dogs, it's a very sensitive issue and, uh, we do have very deep cultural association with dogs. Okay, now you also said there are so many millions of dogs in the entire country. It's humanly impossible to, like, you know, whatever, like manage them. But then you also mentioned that, you know, we have to, uh, like, uh, select, prioritize what is what we want to, want to save. Okay, now uh, it is very clear that, you know, in wildlife, they are affecting more than wildlife and in street, like, in dogs, the issue most of the conflicts the human. Because of dogs are in the urban areas. If you come to Delhi and Sierra, in Noida, especially where I live, a lot of countries happen because you know people don't like street dogs around. Even they are, even I have personally seen that you know uh, they're very calm dogs, but just people don't want the dogs. And there sometimes people also provoke the dogs. I think this is a debate we can have, uh, I think, months and years. But now the question, well, one question from Megha, uh, she's a dog activist from uh, Ghaziabad actually. So she asked him, what is the data of, of number of dogs around wildlife areas? since you are either referring to all Indian numbers or rural numbers, neither of which are specific to the issue of wildlife areas. So there are also many urban settlements far away from wildlife areas. Why should those street animals not be fed? The reason any sterilization numbers even exist is because cheetahs can catch dogs for sterilization. This is her uh, comment and question. So would you like to respond to it? Okay, so you mentioned a couple of points and then I'll come back to yeah. Megha's uh, yeah. question as well. Um, so you, uh, you know, you touched upon the idea of, uh, um, sorry, I, I, I think I've lost that thread, but no, I, culture, culture, faith, yeah, you talked about culture, you talked about dog, culture and, you know, this deep linkage with, with domestic dogs. Look, culture keeps changing as cities evolve as human population. A lot of things that were a part of our culture have gone away as, as well. Um, for me, it's, it seems strange that in some sense, we're also being a little hypocritical when we talk about culture and we talk about feeding and so on. So we did a study in Bangalore and um, we found that most people, that we found that a very small number of households were feeding dogs in their neighborhoods and those households were responsible for most of the dogs that were there in that, in that area. In addition, people who visit like tea shops and you know roadside bakeries would feed dogs there. Okay, so this is where most of the, you know, I know there's lots of people here who are dog feeders who go out there and catch them and sterilize them and vaccinate them. And maybe they're doing some, they're, as far as they're concerned, they're, they're, they're doing it correctly. But what we found is the va vast majority of people who do this casual feeding, uh, it was uh, somebody used a very nice term for this. I completely agree with that. That's low stakes <laughs> niceness. They do nothing for those dogs. They will throw a small one packet of biscuits on the street and they'll walk away. They don't sterilize them. They don't vaccinate them. Those households that are keeping those dogs out on the street, they say we are doing it for the protection of our street. How does that make any sense? If you want to protect your street, you want to protect, you can protect your house. The protection of the street is, is the job of the government. It's not the job of the domestic dog on that house. Every other people passing at night have an equal right to be moving on those streets safely. So that, that to me doesn't gel. The other part that, you know, the question that she's asking, where are these numbers coming from? Um, so uh, for the most part, what we do is, because it's difficult for us to estimate numbers of dogs everywhere, what we do is we link, we use what are called human dog ratios. And these are rough ratios that have been developed, uh, you know, after studying many places. And so we look at the human population in landscape, and then we can have a rough estimation of what the dog population in that landscape also should be. And this is more or less it holds, okay? Because dog numbers are very tightly correlated with human numbers. Wherever there are more humans, there will also be more dogs. So this is where we get most of those numbers from when we're talking about, uh, 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 you know, when we're talking about wildlife, especially in rural areas where there's lots of wildlife. We, we so for example, 
in uh, in villages around Baramati in, and so on, we we estimated something like uh, between uh, 25 to 30 dogs per square kilometer in the villages. And then that becomes less as you go out into the farms. But, you know, India also, if you if you take a flight from anywhere to anywhere, you'll see it's like one village after the other, after the other, after the other. So there's like, there's no area which is free of human settlements. So that's why dogs are also everywhere in the landscape. Um, and, and their impacts are then going to be quite high on, on, on wildlife wherever they exist. Yeah. So, uh, and I think she she mentioned made some point about sterilization. I, I you know the, the the like I said, sterilization doesn't work. You can sterilize all you want. In fact, you yourself must have seen that you've probably been feeding and sterilizing dogs for years, and this probably made no difference to the population. Uh, every every day, every year, new dogs will come up. As long as you keep feeding them, as long as there is food available, more and more dogs will keep feeding showing up and my friend and colleague Meghna says this is like uh, ABC is like um, trying to mop the floor while while the tap is running. So, you know, it's an endless problem. It's, you know. So, Abhi, uh, there's an interesting uh, aspect to it. So, uh, there's no name, it's an anonymous comment, but it says, I will just summarize it. Many comments, I will just take uh, the issue. So that there is a relationship with the dogs and our inability to manage our waste management system. Okay, and the next question is, uh, if we don't, so first is that the, we are, it's the inability of our human civilization to uh, like manage our waste. And then if you don't feed these dogs, will they not go out and hunt more? And that will basically mean we are killing, you know, starvation, might as well euthanize them then. The problem of garbage is very large one and a whole other, uh, you know, not as easy to solve as making a mess. So basically the point is that, you know, one is that if you don't feed the dogs, they will anyway die and they, they will make more aggressive. And the problem with the human waste management. I think this is what it's coming So, yeah, I, I look, this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, one, we do need to manage our garbage problem. We do need to keep our cities cleaner for, for a lot of reasons. Okay, so let's imagine that we do manage our gar garbage problem. What's going to happen to the dogs then? They're going to not, not, not going to have enough food to eat. So then are we going to feed those dogs? If we start feeding them, then their populations are going to keep increasing because the sterilization rates will never keep up to it. Okay. Um, what we also found was though that uh, feeding actually contributes. This is in cities. This is not, you know, in villages, it's a, it's a separate issue. Um, in, in cities, feeding contributes to a lot of the pro high proportion of dogs that you see on the streets because most Indian households, the garbage that we generate doesn't have too much. You know, we hate throwing away food. Okay. We, our culture is not to throw away. So actually, what do we do? We put it in a plastic bag and then we'll go it and put it in a garbage dump so that a cow eats it or a dog eats it. Okay. So whether we are uh, you know, meaningfully wanting to go out there and throw the food in the garbage or whether we want to go and actually feed an animal, the, the end result is the same. That we, are, we want somebody to eat that food. We don't want to want it to go waste. So a lot of people will do that also. Go and you know, put some chapatis, leftover chapatis or rice or dal or whatever. And so some cow will eat it or you know, whatever. So our garbage dumps often have a lot of food in them. But what we found is that where, there's, where you can have large garbage dumps, but you don't necessarily have that much, that high population of, of dogs. If there's, uh, for example, if garbage segregation is being done. In many places in Bangalore, for instance, we, we uh, estimated how much garbage is there on the road and whether that was correlated to dog density or not. And we found that doesn't happen. Instead, dogs, dog density is correlated to where people are feeding them. So near, uh, near these chai shops and uh, uh, you know, roadside bakeries or where houses are feeding them uh, in, in layout. So that's where you tend to find the most number of dogs. Um, I also think that we need to have, uh, we need to plan properly that if you want to stop people from feeding dogs, then we should also have a plan to build sufficient number of shelters. See, all of these things have to happen at the same time. It can't be like you do this and then you do this and then you do this. You know, there used to be a plan, an integrated plan. And we cannot keep hi hiding under this lazy rhetoric or no, no, we can no, never solve this problem. India is too big a country, we can't do this. If that's the case, then we're not gonna do anything. Um, I'll take, a, take the example of a city like Baramati, which has very few dogs on, on the main streets because A, there's very little garbage there. B, nobody feeds the dogs there. Okay, 
So if you, the, the only place that you'll see dogs in Baramati are either in the garbage dump or um, or in the older parts of town where there's you no know, the marketplace and so on. So then there are people throwing some food or in those places. But otherwise you don't see too many dogs on the street there. So it'll be interesting for us to see cities that rank high on the clean, you know, the Clean India Mission campaigns. So cities like Indore, uh, what their population of dogs is and you know whether it correlates or not. So there is a one question from Dilip. Uh, so he's asking uh, how to prevent dog deer and dog blackbird conflict inside a college campus. Will removing the dogs lead to drastic increase in the number of the herbivores, which may lead to competition among them? That's a good question. Um, so this is a you know this is an issue that's come up in many places around um, around campuses in India where we found uh, lots of predation by dogs on on. So I'll give you an example of IIT Madras. IIT Madras campus uh, was you know is a really lovely forest area that was carved out of the Gindi National Park. And um, for years now, you know, there uh, people have been reporting that dogs are killing black box, they're killing, they're killing cheetah. Um, the couple of wildlife scientists who advised them said that, you know, if you remove the dogs and the herbivore populations and explore. So actually what's happening though, is that the dogs are mostly killing the fawns of black buck. And for years, there was no successful reproduction of, uh, of the black buck population. This is a phenomenon called apparent competition. So they're also killing cheetah, but they're also they're killing black buck. And black, black buck are the more endangered species. They were, I think, down to maybe the last 20 or 30 black buck down on campus and then had no successful reproduction for several years because every fawn that was born was immediately being killed by dogs. Um, so in some cases, uh, uh, a lifting of predation pressure will result in populations going up. But you know what else will happen if you remove dogs from there? You'll probably have wild predators come back, things like jackals. Jackals will come back into the system. Uh, right now, most of our campuses, which used to have jackals earlier, don't have them because of the high numbers of dogs in these places. Yeah. So now we'll take the last question. I think then we will uh, wrap up this session. So last question is that, uh, Adoption of street dogs won't happen overnight. Uh, can you suggest practical plans as an alternative to not feeding dogs? As dogs are dependent on human for foods, who shall provide them food? Do we let them die of starvation? Uh, this is, look, this is a complicated problem. Uh, I'm not saying that, first of all, what, what I would really like to see is I would like to stop uh, see the stopping of irresponsible feeding. And I've said this many times. I know there are many of you out there who are responsible feeders, who take care of the dogs that you feed, that you sterilize them, vaccinate them, but the vast majority of people don't do that. And I think one of the first things that needs to, needs is that this has to stop. We should also eventually not feed dogs in public places because um, you know it, it does cause, in fact, there are several court verdicts. I know lots of people rejoiced recently when the Supreme Court lifted that stay, but what they don't do is they don't go back to the Delhi High Court rules and, and read the conditions that the Delhi High Court had imposed upon where people can feed dogs. Now, if those, if those, uh, uh, if those orders are imposed, I promise you a lot of people will, will, not, will stop feeding dogs. The other thing is this, people talk about feeding dogs as an act of great compassion. But with compassion, you know, paraphrasing Spider-Man, uh, there should also be responsibility. Um, if if a dog that you feed attacks somebody and you know they don't it's not like somebody has to throw a stone at them or uh, you know disturbs the dog in any way people dogs attack any street any street in india you go in the evening if you're on a motorcycle if you're on a cycle if you're running early morning walking or people walking their own dogs sometimes you will have dogs come and attack you okay um, are the feeders going to take responsibilities for these uh, recently somebody sent me photos of cars being really badly damaged by, uh, by, the, by dogs in an, in an apartment society. Who's going to take responsibility for that? So this is my question. People are feeding, yes. People say they have a right to feed. Many people say that, you know, our, the constitution tells us that we have to have compassion. I fully agree the, uh, the constitution del, does tell us it's our duty to have compassion to all living beings, but it says to all living beings, it says not just to dogs. Uh, why are we very narrowly defining where their compassion is, should be directed? 
so this this is my you know these are my broad philosophical questions i think these things are not thought through and our animal welfare ethos has sort of become really muddy uh, you know we seem to sort of uh, as with many things we become very polarized in this aspect but just think about it think about what is the long term objective what what do you see as a future for for yourself for these dogs do you, is this something that you want to do forever or do you want to have these dogs have a better life in the end you know it, to me is very clear dogs in human companionship fully owned fully taken care of they have the best outcomes uh, dogs living on streets don't so for me that's the end goal i don't want to see dogs on the streets other people keep saying no oh, this is their natural habitat i think that's no such thing and we should try and get out of that mindset as soon as we can yeah. yeah thank you very much abhi for your time and sharing your knowledge experiences on this uh, issue of dog wildlife and human conflict because i think this is such so, so a sensitive issue and uh, we have so many different opinions and uh, you know things it's very important to listen to different perspective and uh, you are being expert of animal ecology so this perspective is very much important because for as a uh, what is the think tank for us like you know i personally have been observing this issue and i personally don't see any solution like practical solution to there may be many solutions so but practical solution we are still uh, not able to find and uh, hopefully we will be doing something on this issue like you try to uh, do something maybe we can come back to you and other also right because uh, there are so many things with the dogs and you know we need to understand all the perspective and this is really helpful uh, to understand the wild life biologist perspective and uh, overall like how the system functions and i would also like to thank the participants for joining today and asking some really interesting questions and i'm sure uh, dr banak also enjoyed answering those questions and here answered very well very directly uh, so i think we are really uh, i'm really thankful to you for uh, uh, spending uh, effort to answer those questions and uh, i would like to thank my colleagues uh, himanshu tarika and keshav for their help uh, in organizing this event a special thanks to rainmeta foundation and mr sandeep singhal for supporting the work of uh, climatic systems team at vidhi and we will be uploading this recording of uh, this talk on our website soon it will be available on the youtube channel as uh, we finish this talk and please do follow our uh, twitter linkedin and instagram for regular updates and uh, take care uh, have a great weekend bye thank you thank you all. thank you